clavichord is the predecessor of the harpsichord, which is the predecessor of the piano, which is the predecessor of the end of the world. <laughs> I like to know the history of mankind. <laughs> um, you can do this with a clavichord, you can't do it with any other keyboard instrument. Six months to train a, a keyboard player to do that. You don't do that. Okay, I'll play a little bit of Bach for you. Delicate little thing. It's amazing. Haven't been practicing enough. I've got to get back and practice again. It escapes me. Mm. Strange. It sounds similar to a, I was going to say a lute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're close alike in, in historical music, too. It's a lute piece that he transcribed for clavichord. That's a remarkable instrument. Oh, it will go from here. Sounded a little like music from his cello suite. Yes. <laughs> Bothers me, I can't. side of the tree, 17 grams to the inch, and now I'm pulling your leg on, <laughs> on the next, taking in the dark of the moon. <laughs> but very thin wood. It's a, a wood, the old instruments had uh, wooden naturals and ivory capped sharps because ivory was so scarce and so expensive. So they're always dark and light, as is with my harpsichord. Then when they made piano, they reversed it just to let the world know this is a different instrument. 
Everybody comes and says, oh, but the keys are backward. <laughs> no, it's Europe that's backward. Did the Germans invent the piano? Who invented the piano? <laughs> German, uh, Austrian. First piano was about 1725. It was called a piano forte because it could be played loud or soft, which a harpsichord wouldn't do, but a clavichord will. from here to here and this is in felt so it doesn't vibrate and that's the damper system for it <laughs> they go out of tune easily I lived in Los, Los Angeles, had a big <coughs> Mack truck of a modern German harpsichord. Somebody rang my doorbell <coughs> and an animacy, blustery, middle-aged woman said, my name is Shibley Boys. I'm the pianist for the Philharmonic. We hear you have a harpsichord. We want to rent it. Rent it for a part of a concert, and I'll have to play it, and I've never seen one. Would you give me lessons? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, we made fast friends. She was a wonderful gal. And the quickest way you can get a, a nine-foot Steinway out of a pianist's hands is to make them learn the clavichord. So I made her learn to play the clavichord. Her instinct was, boom! <clears throat> okay, now look. Okay. <laughs> Is it the same number of keys? Yeah. Two keyboards. <clears throat> we had more fun. <clears throat> we got it down for the rehearsal. Uh, she lost her cool, she lost her courage, and begged me to come along for the rehearsal. <clears throat> and my harp, the big German harpsichord had five pedals down here, uh, which did nothing resembling piano pedals. <clears throat> and she lost her, her courage, and she said, Robert, uh, you, you've got to do the pedals for me. So I lay down <laughs> on the harpsichord and uh, was changing the pedals as required. And the Philharmonic going into hysterics of laughter. <laughs> you had a business for a while running in instruments yeah. for mm -hmm. studios. Yeah. And <clears throat> Before I got an analytical practice going, which is a very slow business. Especially when you're an introvert and look stupid. So I, I lived on harpsichords for a while. Came the concert time. Well, I can't lie under the harpsichord during the performance. So she lost her cool again. Rubber, rubber. 
set up a ham and egg setting for the pedals so I won't, won't have to change them. I'll do something wrong. Okay. So I put moderate settings for things. And she, she played the concert and went off well. She played... Uh, they rented that harpsichord many times for the Philharmonic. This isn't the last but that I rescued from the trash heap. It was signed and dated, built by Arnold Dolmetsch in 1912. Arnold Dolmetsch almost single-handedly uh, brought the art of harpsichord, clavichord building back into fashion. <coughs> now this is a clavichord. If I, I could show you up close, the strings are struck. <coughs> and the extraordinary thing about a clavichord <coughs> is that the key has no bottom. You have to determine how far down the key, key is going to go. And yeah, you can get the bebung, as they call it. And that is, with great care and training, you can get a vibrato out of it. Clavichord is the hardest thing on the earth to, to record. And it's only recently with new developments that they have microphones that can catch it. about six months of training anybody, any keyboard player to make use of the bebung because the, the vibrato is up and down, it's not sideways. And if you don't have that under control you can get the most uh, outlandish wail out of a clavichord.
sorry. Way out of practice. But that, that's the maximum volume of a clavichord. That's, that's a big fortissimo. I don't, don't dare strike any harder than that. And then it goes on down to... Okay, Violet Gordon Woodhouse. What a character. After I found this instrument, it was floating around Los Angeles, and an eccentric young guy had bought it. I don't know where he found it, but uh, he had been doing all sorts of things to it to make it louder. He would put heavier strings on it. He had carved out a hole in the, the bottom of the plank here. And it's true, it got um, quite a bit more volume out of it. But, but it didn't sound like the clavichord, which it was. Presently, <coughs> he decided he needed some cash desperately, so he offered it to me. I bought it and took it back to its original sting, stringing and filled up the hole in, in the bottom uh, board, brought it back down to pitch again. I had played one other doll match clavichord 30 years or so ago and had just shamelessly fallen in love with the sound of it. I tried to find a doll match to buy somewhere along the way. But I'd never been able to. I even planned to go to Dolbach factory in Hazelmere in England. But uh, we, we somehow didn't uh, connect up, so I, I, I was <laughs> delighted to find this instrument, though it didn't sound like the clavichord of 35 years ago. I didn't know whether it ever would or not. <laughs> so it, it's restored its original voice. And I had it was about a year. been working, restringing, and so forth. The, these bass strings are spiral wound strings. <laughs> not just the delicacy of the, the main string with a wire wrapped around it like this, but <clears throat> uh, the wrapping is, is spiral so that <clears throat> uh, you, you get the weight necessary for the tr string to speak at the low pitch without the the stiffness uh, of the wrapping. It's hard to make uh, spiral wrapped strings. The art is to uh, uh, make a device which turns the string at both ends and you put two wrappings on it touching and you still uh, anchor those one of those, and you unwrap one of them, and that leaves the remaining wrapped string uh, a wrapping distance apart. It's the only, only way to get uh, even <coughs> uh, spiral bound bass strings. <coughs> I was rapidly falling in love with this instrument. I love to play it. And a friend came across this book in an old bookshop. And it's a book about Violet Gordon Woodhouse and her eccentric carryings on in, 
in London around 1912. She was a high eccentric and broke all kinds of uh, usual English customs for her time. Or even you know, our time. There's another picture of an her in all of her glory. And it shows a picture of her clavichord, which is this instrument. So you don't often get a historical perspective on an instrument as well. She was such an eccentric. The book is about her, but only mentions a time or two of her clavichord which she had gotten Arnold Dolmetsch to build for her. I don't know what this instrument did between 1912 and present day, but I get a good laugh out of the fact that it came from such an eccentric household in 1912 to this house. The keys startle people. <clears throat> They're used to white naturals and black sharps. <clears throat> but uh, this system was the original on <clears throat> any old instrument, black naturals and <clears throat> maybe ivory or maybe just light wood caps for the sharps. And it was the piano that reversed this to prove to the new piano owners that they had a very different instrument from anything that had come before. Now people do quite the opposite. A friend of mine, uh, one of the junior colleges, was just wildly enthusiastic about these things. My own clavichord was functioning then. So he said to me and my godson Rob, uh, come and play us a concert. And I jokingly said, well, you'll have to turn the air conditioner off because it makes too much sound for interference. And he said, we'll do it. So he managed this, whatever it took to have, have the air conditioner stopped from three, 10 minutes past three in the afternoon of the concert until four o'clock. So we. We did our things in a relatively silent hall. Uh, I think there were a couple hundred students in the audience. I lectured them within an inch of their life. I said, now you don't make a sound, you don't rustle your feet, you don't turn page in a book. And I played several compositions on the clavichord. And Rob, who was playing viol de gamba, and I did things on the rockers and his viol de gamba. For several years, we hired ourselves out for $10 a concert, mostly to get practice for him. 
He turned into a professional musician and got a fine position at Wesleyan University as professor of old music, I think. I have a wonderful picture somewhere of the concert I'm talking about. Rob is sitting there in his majesty with his uh, old Villa de Gamba. I'm at the harpsichord. We had such fun. Well, I'll tell you one story out of that era of my life. <laughs> Rob was starting uh, hopefully to be a professional musician, which he did. He made it. But he started uh, late for a career. He came in one day and he flopped himself down in a chair in my room. And he said, Bobsy, I've got to be a musician. That was the first I'd heard anything about it. I taught him a little bit of harpsichord years earlier, but it hadn't ever interested him much. So, okay, what do you want to learn to play? Stringed instrument, medium low pitch, not a violin. Well, viola de gamba is the same pitch as our modern cello, six strings rather than four, and a fretted keyboard. So I went out and found a newly bit built uh, viola de more, and we set to work. I, I don't know anything about stringed instruments. So I found him a teacher, and we studied, and we worked, and we played dozens of hours, hundreds of hours. He learned very fast. He liked old music. We came to the point where he could um, approach the art of uh, ornamentation and 18th century music. The old scores were just the bare bones of the, the composition that the originator wanted to put out. And the ornamentation is left up to the player. He'd probably do something different every every playing of it, so it's up to one's own ingenuity. Oh. We were ready for one of the concerts, I think the one we have pictures of. And I had been teaching Rob uh, an Italian trill. And that's an intricate thing, that you have to know what you're doing in order to pull it off. Italian trill is appropriate for a long held single note. And the composition by Handel, which we were going to play for that concert, had such a, a long, two or three measures long, single note. And to embellish it with an Italian trill, consists of playing very briefly the note below the note itself that one is going to embellish and a note above and then uh, continuously the note, the note below the note, the note below the note for as long and until you get to an a rhythmically accented point, end of the measure. And this was a three or four measure long uh, repeated note. 
And every time one came to an accented place, the end of measure, new measure, one repeats this and then settles down to the trill. And one can get lost famously. Rob got lost often. I said, no, look, if you get lost anywhere in the concert, you just plow ahead and I'll find you. Otherwise, we're trying to find each other, never get back. And I said, now, don't try an Italian trill on that note. We're sure to get lost. He came out uh, about one time in three when we had been working on the Italian trill. Too dangerous. Don't, don't you dare try an Italian trill. Well, here we go. We're playing at the concert. I, I saw in some set of his chin what he was going to do. We were already launched. Uh, we come to this long held note and he starts the Italian trill and I almost lose my place with anxiety. He did it perfectly and we sailed on.